presentation. Uh, awesome. So this is crisis communications for incident response. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what that means in a second. But first, I have to do the obligatory. This is a picture of me. Um, I'm an advanced persistent incident responder at GitHub. Um, does anybody know GitHub? Heard about it? OK, great. So we're a t-shirt and sticker company. Um, we're getting into Git hosting. We think the Git hosting thing might work out for us, but we're not sure. Um, because I saw Sans was cool and had a Twitter account and uh, a hashtag, I decided to do the same thing. So if you want to tweet at me, you can use CCIR. Um, and I should be upfront that I am not an expert in this. Um, I do incident response most of the time. I don't actually write a lot of public statements. But uh, I came across this and thought it was an interesting topic. Uh, and it turns out I know a bunch of people who do this type of work. Um, I, I turn out have a bunch of friends who are all in either public relations and a number of people at GitHub who came out of basically doing crisis communications for public scandals, publicity problems, things like that. Um, so I consulted them. But this all started with a blog post uh, back in September, actually. And uh, I was reading through Krebs, and I came across an interesting article. And I went to my boss and I said, this is a great example of how an incident can be done really, really well. So uh, does anybody remember the big incident from uh, September 2014? OK. Uh, P.F. Chang's got hacked. I, I know, everyone's devastated. Um, P.F. Chang's got, had a, a credit card breach. and came out and published a bunch of stuff about it. And it turns out it wasn't a story. Almost no one knows it happened. Brian Krebs posted two things about it. The public didn't really get into it. Um, and it turns out that's because they did a really good job of talking about what happened. And so I thought, uh, I wonder if anybody's looking into this. And no one really was. Uh, and what it was was a good example of crisis communications. So I thought, maybe I should share some of what I learned. So what is crisis communications? Um, and I did what everybody does, and I immediately looked on Wikipedia. And according to Wikipedia, it's a subspecialty of the public relations field, profession that is designed to protect and defend an individual company, organization, or facing a public challenge to its reputation. Pretty simple. But I need simpler than that. That's, that's still a lot. So it's what happens when everything goes wrong. Um, so then you need to define, OK, what, what's going wrong? Well, it, if you're a real public relations person, it could be a celebrity scandal. It could be a company health issue, things like that. But for us, it comes down to three, technically four major things. Um, you could have a breach where you're actually dealing with a confidentiality or integrity failure, um, generally resulting from someone getting into your network. Uh, you could have a vulnerability. And, and this is one that wasn't immediately apparent to me. But you often have to do crisis communications when something comes out where there's a vulnerability in your system, especially in the case where a, the user has to do something in order to help you fix it. Should I be standing up here? Is this better? Feels weirdly pretentious. Um, it also kind of feels like I'm on a rave, so I don't know. Um, uh, given I work at GitHub, I can't not talk about the fact that you, you do also have to do crisis communications in the event of a DDoS, uh, which is a failure of availability. So I've covered all the parts of the CIA triangle. I think I'm good. Um, in case you don't know what a DDoS looks like, this is, in fact, what they look like. Really? <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, the other time you end up having to do crisis communications is frankly for not one of these things. Um, there are a number of cases where someone basically has a rumor they've been compromised, or a rumor they're knocked offline for a DDoS, and you have to come up and say, no, here's what the actual story is. So OK, you're all convinced. We all need to know about this. We all need to be doing this better. Um, is anybody going to argue with me right off the bat that we're doing this really, really well? Because I'll point you at United right now and ask you if you think we're doing this really, really well. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, I hope you're not flying United tonight, because you're not flying out. So 
Uh, I asked a bunch of people who do public relations, what are the five keys for good crisis communications? And, and here, are the, here are the things they gave me. Uh, the first one is to be clear. Uh, if the people you're talking with don't understand your message, you won't be able to get it across, and they won't know what they're, what they're really trying to deal with. Um, sorry, unfortunately my notes aren't up here, so it's really throwing me off. Um, so we all investigate intrusions. No one would say that's an easy job. And it's hard to explain that job on top of it. Um, you know, even when we're talking with other intrusion teams, you're still trying to deal with the fact that, that these are complicated issues. But what, what about when you're talking to folks who aren't technical, folks who don't understand the lingo you're using, or people who are only semi-technical? What if you're talking with your CFO, who doesn't understand what O days and forensic analysis and all those things are? The way we get around this, according to the public relations specialists, is uh, everything should be on a fifth grade reading level. So um, my wife's in education, and I, and I asked, what is a fifth grade reading level? Turns out there's no technical definition of what a fifth grade reading level is. Um, so her exact words were, well, it's, it's basically like the first two Harry Potter books. Um, not the later ones where they get scary. But um, that's what we're aiming for. And, and this probably is the one slide that you should take away from this whole talk. If you only remember one thing, um, without understanding, with, without a clear message of what's going on, uh, victims will remain confused and critics will be skeptical. Um, no one wants to be running the incident that has everyone in the security community writing a blog post telling you how your details are actually just a little bit off and you just don't know. And clarity is about, not, not just about one message, but about multiple messages. So in today's age, one of the things that the, the PR folks I talked to made a big point of is something that's different is in the 80s, you put out a press statement, and that was it. And now, part of the thing that's made that field so complicated is you're running a website, putting out press statements, going on Twitter, interacting with people on Snapchat. Um, it, it goes on and on and on. And so the ability to be clear, the ability to get your message across consistently has to go across multiple mediums and across multiple messages. Uh, I have a couple little asides. Um, one of them, attribution doesn't actually help clear up your, your nobody noticed the equation, Brian Williams, behind it? Too subtle. Um, <laughs> Am I going to have to explain the jokes? Is this, is this what we're doing? Um, he was with the NSA, though, it's true. Um, one of the things people do when they're trying to put out a message that they think is going to help is talk about things like attribution. Um, I'm not going to get into an attribution debate. Uh, I think attribution is really important for a lot of the technical investigations. But it turns out CNN doesn't actually care whether it was APT1 Hyper Falcon. Um, they just, it, it just muddies your message. Uh, another thing to think about, when, it talks about when we're talking about clarity, who has seen an intrusion by an advanced actor? Um, these are a series of words that we at GitHub have banned from putting in our incident communications um, because they don't tell anybody anything. Uh, don't use nation state. You probably don't have good enough attribution to know whether it really is a nation state or not. And you look a lot dumber when you find out it's a bunch of kids in their basement. Um, don't use the word unusual. You wouldn't be reporting on it if it wasn't unusual. It turns out that's a big deal. And advanced, persistent, and sophisticated are just abusive. Um, I, I want someone to come out and admit to being hacked by a basic, dumb, lazy actor. Um, I think that would actually be really interesting. Um, and so I included a bunch of quotes from people who know a lot more about public relations than I do. Uh, and I thought this one was particularly good when it comes to clarity. Uh, because you don't really know what part of your message is going to be picked up and become newsworthy. So it, it's really important to think through what you're saying. So cool, be clear. Be timely. Um, this, by the way, is the hardest one of these five things for what we are talking about. And it's the one that you most consistently see vendors make mistakes on. 
So if you communicate about a breach or a DDoS or something too early, you have to make a lot of follow-ups. You look like you don't actually know what's going on. We're going to talk about some examples of some people who made this mistake a little bit later.、Um, but if you communicate too late, your warning's not actionable, and you end up seeming like you're out of control and don't know what's going on. So, so that's a really bad place to be. If we're too early, we look like you know we made a bunch of mistakes. If we're too late, we looked oblivious.、Um, so you really have to walk that line.、Uh, the best option seems to be over communicating and and assuming the worst. Uh, because I would much rather say the first phrase than to say the second phrase.、Um, something I do have to bring up in this case is、uh, there are, when it comes to timeliness,、um, a lot of industries have their hands tied. So if you're under any of those acronyms that I'm really glad I don't have to deal with a lot,、um, they're going to hold you to the, your feet to the fire on. You can wait 30 days. You can wait 90 days.、Uh, I don't know if there are any. Are there any shorter? Breach notification timeframes. I don't know.、Um, and, and this was, I thought, a, a great quote: "The secret of crisis management is not good versus bad; it's preventing bad from getting worse." And so, when you're thinking through your timing, it, it's important to note you can't actually make a, a problem go away. Your goal is to help people protect themselves.、Uh, oh, do you want to take a pic now? Okay. I'm trying to be interactive and all that. You guys are really quiet. You didn't have your coffee this morning, huh? I'm on like three cups. It's great.、Um, so, so that leads into the idea of being actionable. So, the whole point of breach communications is you're trying to tell your your victims what they need to understand to protect themselves further. And so that comes down to what you're doing and what they're doing. So, first of all, you need to tell. Users, what they can do to mitigate, or what you're doing to mitigate the problem you're dealing with. So, if it's a breach, you need to say, "We've,、uh, you know, we've worked to block this at the firewall, what, whatever." You need to tell them what you're doing in the short term to prevent a problem from getting worse. You need to tell them what you're doing to remediate the problem. What are you doing to make it better in the long term? This one is really important, and it's it's not always done very well. You need to let people know how they can identify if they're affected by the problem you're dealing with. So if it's a breach, you need to let them know if it was their email address and their email account that was was taken, or if they don't have anything to worry about. You need to say what you're doing to protect organizations、uh, or protect users.、Um, in this case, it's almost always just credit monitoring.、Um, does anybody in the room not have credit monitoring from like three different people? You're on three. I am two. OPM Anthem, and I don't know. Somebody else got hacked. <laughs> Basically everyone. It's great.、Um, and going along with that, you, you need to tell users what they can do to protect themselves.、Um, is it important to change passwords? Is it important to roll、uh, authentication tokens? Is it important to patch your system?、Um, being actionable is is. Is a combination, and, it, and it, it's really important to also focus on what people can do to protect themselves.、Um, and I thought this quote from John Rockefeller was fantastic. Next to doing the right thing, the most important thing is to let people know you're doing the right thing.、Um, and that's all about communicating actionability. I mean, being able to say on the back end, we were doing, you know, we did thousands of hours worth of work to make sure this breach doesn't happen again, is a great thing, and you need to do it. But it's also a good idea to make sure your users know that you did the same thing, because that inspires confidence and makes them feel good about coming back.、Um, being responsible,、um, and and this one does get a little scary. And is, is this one's interesting because there's a lot of work coming out of this from the medical field, and so、uh, the 70s and 80s, you might know, were a very litigious point for the medical field in the United States. Uh, everyone was suing everyone. Everyone was in trouble for everything.、Um, and in about, I think it was 2012, a group of doctors in Minneapolis had a weird idea: let's stop worrying about getting sued, and let's tell people we're sorry. And, and that was a really risky thing on their part.、Um, but it turns out, admitting what went wrong and saying you're sorry actually does a lot to help your own case as the people at fault, because. By being empathetic, by, by by being somebody that people can understand, you go from 
a, a huge megacorp that made a you know, terrible blunder to a couple people having a bad day. And so uh, it, it's a really fine line to walk again, but there's an incredible amount of power to being up front and admitting we made a mistake, we're sorry, we're, we're trying to fix it. Um, but because you are opening yourself up to a certain amount of responsibility, um, it, it takes some collaboration. And so uh, not just your security team, you're going to have to work with the public relations team. Uh, I, this is a, a little aside. Uh, I got to write my first postmortem when I was at GitHub, and I had, I'd brought in a lot of these lessons even then. Um, and so we had a very minor security thing that, that I had to work through, and my post was like, I am so sorry we failed you as, a, as an organization, and everything's terrible, and I'm going to never work in security again. And I had to get dialed back by our public relations team because it wasn't that big a deal. But, but that's the, the power of working with other teams to understand how to put out one of these messages. Uh, customer support, also an important one. We, we learned very quickly that anything we said publicly as far as statements, crisis communications, things like that, resulted in a ton of email to our, our uh, customer support team. So having them in the loop early made a, a really big difference. Being responsible often involves bringing in third parties to help you work a breach. Um, I've worked at one of them. It's a good thing. I'm not busting on those. But people love vendor name dropping in their crisis communications. Um, and coming out and saying, like, oh, we brought in X team uh, doesn't actually help outside of the security community. But people love doing it. So uh, something I, I really recommend avoiding, because in a very small group, it makes a difference. But overall, to the public, it doesn't. Man, I thought this would kill. This was a good, this was a good <laughs> GIF. This is a good GIF. Oh, you guys are tough. Um, so when it comes to taking responsibility, I chose a quote from Mark Twain. Um, in his typical tongue-in-cheek kind of way, uh, acknowledge fault frankly, this will throw those in authority off their guard and give you the opportunity to commit more. Uh, uh, and going along with responsibility is the idea of being human. Um, it's, it's incredibly easy to want to hide behind a wall of legalese, to want to hide behind a bunch of prepared statements and things like that. But, but again, you're trying to get people to understand that, that you're a group of humans who ha are having a bad day. Uh, and that empathy is really powerful. So um, it, it's important to learn how to sound human. Again, gosh, this is a tough crowd. Rob, CT, San CTI was a lot easier. They laughed a lot more. It is. That's, oh, that's true. Okay. Um, well, Arnold here will tell you the, that in order to sound human when it comes to crisis communications, um, going through a single person makes a big difference. Uh, text built by committee tends to sound like text built by committee. Um, you want to avoid legal terms, jargon. You know, this goes back to that list of bad words. Like, don't say zero day. We can't agree what that means inside the security community. We can't assume anybody outside it has any idea. Um, I tend to do a thing where I'll say, some, I'll say what I want to say, I'll write it down, I'll read it back to myself, uh, and then I read it out loud because I do things like forgetting words and stuff like that. Um, and then get a lot of feedback, but uh, more moving one word versus another, not so much you know, reworking the entire text 40 times until it sounds like you know, it was computer generated. So, so those are the five big things. Does anybody remember them all? There you go. Uh, it still counts. Um, <laughs> be clear, be timely, be actionable, be responsible, be human. If you can do those five things, this is going to be pretty easy. Um, something else to keep in mind, though, is your audience, because while those five things stay true no matter who your audience is, you do have to make certain adjustments based on who the audience is. Um, so external. Uh, most of what we've been talking about is, is pretty much aimed at external communication. Um, making press releases, putting stuff out on social media, all, all of that. 
But you also have to consider um, talking to executives. Uh, if you're the security team and you're having a security incident, chances are you're going to get dragged into a room with, you know, the four or five scariest people at your company, and they're going to want you to explain what on earth's going on. Uh, the one thing, in my personal experience, um, this is not the time to fight for budget. I feel like a lot of people love doing that. Of you know, massive security incident. Clearly, we need to go buy shiny four hundred thousand dollar one U box that I've always wanted but haven't gotten to get for Christmas. And I really recommend avoiding that. It's it's incredibly important to make sure that your executive team understands what you're dealing with in the moment, and the time to go shopping generally comes later. Um, a lot of people often forget about internal communication when it comes to incidents. And this, this has been important to us at GitHub on a number of occasions. Um, if employees don't have a message about what's going on, they'll invent one. And that might mean poking around in files they're not supposed to. That might mean the rumor mill starts going like crazy. It might mean people just start making things up because they don't want to sit at Thanksgiving dinner and look like they don't know what's going on in their own company. So, so one of the things we find is really important is we have to give a message to our users. And that message can even be, here's what's going on. Please don't say anything. And that is a whole lot better than sharing nothing and expecting they won't share anything. Uh, and, and the last um, kind of audience that you have to talk about in all this is, uh, is intelligence sharing. Um, and I know a lot of people are probably, actually there's not a lot of intelligence sharing talks here. I'm kind of surprised. But um, it's become a big thing to share within industry verticals, within I mean, frankly, friend groups, all kinds of things. And you, and you really need to think about how you want to share information about the incident you're dealing with to those types of groups. Um, setting up rules of engagement ahead of time, you know, what you're allowed to say, who you're allowed to say it to, what the timing is, um, makes a big difference. Uh, that's actually, uh, the background is from uh, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, which I thought was good for intel sharing, but it doesn't really show up. <sighs> Oh, come on. I don't know. <laughs> uh, and the point of understanding your audience is really if, if you don't tell your story, someone else will. Uh, and, and the whole point of this is you want to get to the point where you're the ones who are controlling the flow of information, uh, not your employees, not Brian Krebs. <laughs> uh, we, we refer to getting Krebsed as a, as a verb in, in my organization, and no one wants to get Krebsed. Um, so it's important to think about what your medium is for how you're doing these communications. Um, the web is the best. Um, I'm going to go through a couple examples of people who did this well, people who did this poorly. And the, the ones who have done this really, really well can all point to one website and go, here is all the information about what we're dealing with. Uh, in the case where they have to send out things in another medium, it's almost always copied straight from that website and linked back to that website. Best thing you can do is have a plan for putting incident details, putting your breach notification in one place on the web, and just linking everybody else to that. Um, email is also important. Oh, sure. <sighs> if your users have stopped clicking on links and emails, you're doing better than I am. Um, I've been telling them not to for years, and it still keeps happening. So. Uh, the, the, the point is, people are going to follow what they believe are, are legitimate links. Now, I think that one of the best ways to address that is that link should be going somewhere, one, transparently, so don't use a crazy redirect that, you know, makes it, the shorteners are great, but they make everything look shady as can be. Um, and two, put it somewhere that people can feel confident in. Um, so one of the better examples we have later posted all their incident details to a Tumblr. And it turns out um, Tumblr's known for being kind of weird and shady sometimes, but generally not in terms of whether it's hosting bad things or a phishing site or anything like that, more just in terms of, you know, 15-year-old's artwork. So um, pointing people at a known place, um, you know, we point people at blog.github.com. At the point where that's not trustworthy, um, I'll be looking for a job. So I think that's a good place. 
Um, email is an important messaging medium if you know who's affected. So, for instance, if it's a, a small subset of a user population and you can reach directly out to those people and say, here are the details that are important to you. Uh, social media, Twitter is going to become a big thing, I think. Um, it, it's important to be able to get your incident details out on social media. Um, and press releases are still a big thing for some people. So uh, being able to get those out into those four mediums tends to be a pretty complete picture. Uh, but again, at least from what I've seen, the best thing you can do is link, some, li link all of those directly back to a particular website. So now we name names. Now we do some case studies. Um, and we're going to go from some people who give us a lot of things to learn to some people who have done this fairly, fairly well. Does anybody want to guess where I'm going to start? Huh? Hip chat? No, come on. Huh? Bat, uh, HP Gary wasn't very good. Okay. Superfish? Is that a band? OK. Uh, thought about doing OPM, thought about doing Sony, uh, but really, there's just a great example here. So um, let's talk about how Target did crisis communications. Uh, so first, I, I do a little timeline. Um, this was kind of hard, actually. So uh, November 27th to December 15th, the fraud apparently takes place. Um, in on the 15th, they acknowledge it internally. It, it's only 40 million cards. It's not, a, not, not, not huge. Uh, the 18th, Brian Krebs puts out his first article. Uh, on the 19th, Target admits it. Um, but it's, it's incredibly minimal. Very few cards. Um, and then the 21st, the banks just start sending new cards to people, which doesn't sound terribly minimal. Um, on the 27th of December, a third party identifies card and PIN information that goes beyond the, uh, the initial 40. Um, 70 million additional accounts are added, and I think we found another 30 million later. Um, and, and interestingly, from a PR perspective, on the 22nd, um, they laid off 475 employees while having 700 open positions. Um, that just doesn't look good from a PR perspective. In a technical term, that's a no-no. Um, so, so I put in my you know, site target.com breach, and I start looking for information about the particular breach. So um, they've reorganized their website since then, but we got this, uh, and this, and this, and here's a credit monitoring FAQ. Um, and on the sixth page, I found a PDF letter from the CEO to the public. And this was really, really good. It was on the sixth page of Google, and I had to go hunting for it, but it was really good. Uh, sometime in March, they figured out it was really good and put it on the front page, along with a smiling picture of the guy. So someone figured out it was pretty good. Um, there were a lot of other things in all this. Um, or you could go to Krebs and get everything in about three links. So that's not good. Um, so for clarity, I, I gave them a 4 out of 10. Uh, if there hadn't been so many places to go, all the data was there, but it was just hard to put it all together. Um, timeliness didn't work out terribly well for Target. They, they chose to notify really early um, so they could say, oh, it's not a big deal. And then their investigation made it a bigger deal. Um, actionability, uh, I'm pretty sure I eventually figured out that people got credit monitoring, but that's about all. You don't really know a lot about what they did from a security perspective internally, aside from fire a bunch of people. Um, and the responsibility bit's tough, because it depends where you look. Um, that, that letter that I eventually found did a fantastic job of taking responsibility. Uh, this, this statement was, should have been the first thing on Target.com. Uh, our top pri priority is taking care of you and helping you feel confident about shopping at Target, and it's our responsibility to protect your information when you shop with us. We didn't live up to that responsibility, and I'm truly sorry. So this is human. Uh, this, is, this is responsible, and this is clear. I mean, this, this was a really, really 
well done statement. And it sounds human. Um, I don't know how many lawyers and PR specialists went through this with a fine tooth comb, but it sounds really human. Um, so I gave them a 5 out of 10, because that part was great, but you had to go through a lot of fluff to get to it. So, uh, and I want to be clear, especially if there's anybody in, from Target in the room, um, I'm not busting on Target. Um, they were in a really tough spot. You know, one of the things that was really apparent to me when I looked through this is they were coming up on the three weeks of their year that basically make their entire financial performance. And so wanting to do things like trying to hold everything back and wanting to do things like minimize it um, might not have been 100% accurate from the security perspective, but at some point, we're not here to enable security, we're here to enable a business. And from enabling business, I can understand where they made a lot of the decisions that they made. Please. Fair enough. Fair enough. No, I'll, I'll, I'll admit that. I mean, they, they made it a household thing, partially because of the scale at which they were dealing with it. Um, pl plenty of other people have, been nasty, have had nasty public breaches. Very few have had 110 million cards. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a little bit closer to home, um, this is my alma mater. Um, announced a few months ago that uh, they had been breached. Um, they say Penn State Engineering, um, Penn State runs a lab called the Applied Research Lab that does almost exclusively military research and development. Um, so, I mean, basically I'm, I'm reading between the lines that Penn State Engineering means the part that's doing military research. Um, and we believe they were attacked, I mean, they, they came out and said they were attacked by a nation state hacker. Um, this gets funny. Um, so they, we, they were able to talk about it as one intrusion. Turns out there were two. It like, turns out they brought people in to look for one intrusion and they said, hey, do you know about these guys too? And they said, no. <laughs> and, and things got twice as fun. Um, no, November 21st, they got notified by the FBI. Um, on May 15th, um, the engineering network is taken offline, all the statements are released. Um, I'm, I'm actually still taking a class through Penn State, so I got an email that we got compromised, so that was fun. That was my third one. I couldn't remember who it was. Great, okay, good. Um, they did a really nice job, though, of, of posting everything that day, so on the 15th. And uh, then on the 18th, they announced that their network's back online, everything's fine, move on with your lives. Um, they made it onto a bunch of cool places. So they made it onto Recode. Uh, they made it into the Wall Street Journal. Um, then we get to their actual statements about it. So their news site posted something. Um, the president of the university posted a fairly long, detailed write-up. Um, and then they put together this really great FAQ site that, if you were actually interested in the breach, had everything you wanted to know and you didn't have to listen to the president of the university. Um, and, and what's really interesting, and this is, again, kind of an aside, um, they ended up making it onto The Hill. Does anybody read The Hill? Probably not, because you're not in Congress. Um, it's, it's actually a news publication that's aimed specifically at um, congressional members and their, their staffing. So um, it's, it's interesting that this made it to that level. Um, you know, they had a couple good statements, um, this, this probably being my favorite, about kind of explaining what their timing was. Um, you know, they, they gave us a fairly detailed timeline, but you're sitting there going, you got notified in November, you did something about it in May. That's kind of a long time. And, and they actually spoke to that. So uh, they do a little bit better than Target in terms of clarity. Um, they only had three sites you needed to read. Um, I'm giving, look, it's my alma mater, so I'm giving them a little bit of benefit of the doubt. Um, their timeliness was more due to their investigation than anything else. Um, 
The action ability was kind of limited. They didn't talk a lot about what they did aside from taking the network down. Uh, the email they sent to students gave us a little bit more to deal with, but not a whole lot, uh, because there wasn't really a lot. It's, you know, the, the, there was, it was more, more focused on what ARL could do. Um, and again, once you got to the statement by the president, they did a fairly good job of being responsible and, and human. So for a university, 76, not great, but they end up getting a B minus after the curve. And the A student, or close enough, um, was Slack. Uh, I don't know if anybody uses Slack. If you do, you're probably in about six of them, like me. Um, and, and they announced a breach um, in March. And so uh, they're, they're kind of cagey about the timeline. They don't explain a lot of it. Um, somewhere in early February, they had an incident. Uh, they identified it going on for four days. Um, on March 27th, they finally published information. Um, and they did just a blitz. It, it, it came out on email, social media, website, all that. Um, and it, you know, being there, a Silicon Valley company made it onto every website under the sun. But here's the interesting thing. Within four paragraphs in every example, there's a link back to their Tumblr site. So fourth paragraph's a little farther down on Wired. Here's their Tumblr. And it has everything you could ever want to know. I literally was looking for questions to give them a hard time about, and I couldn't find anything they hadn't already identified. Um, they have a really great FAQ that goes straight into a bunch of actionable things. Um, so, you know, they gave some, some important key statements that really clearly showed whether you, you need to be concerned about this or not. So, we know what was accessed, we know what wasn't accessed. Um, so, they didn't tell us how it happened, but honestly, from, from our perspective, that's not as important. I mean, it's interesting to me from a research perspective, but it doesn't really help me protect myself as a user. So, so they get a 9 out of 10. Um, they, they were timely. They, they speak in their FAQ to how the timing kind of worked out and why it worked the way it did. Um, they're actionable. They released features. They had a breach and released features instead. Uh, one of the news site articles actually talks, it basically says, Slack releases features, oh yeah, they got breached too. Uh, that's a PR win in the best case possible. Um, so, so they, yeah, they released uh, two-factor authentication, and they released a, a password kill switch that lets teams reset all passwords in one shot. That's, a, that's actually really great stuff. Um, their responsibility was good. They focused more on what actions they were taking to keep things from getting worse and make things better than really kind of going into their mistakes, but, but it was good. Um, they didn't do as well on being human, um, it did kind of read like the security team had wrote something, then the legal team had went through it, then the PR team had went through it, then the legal team did it again. Yeah. Um, but, but they got a 94. Um, they, they did a really nice job. If you go read that FAQ, it's, it's actually, it, it's a great example. Um, there's a number of other people who have done this fairly well. Um, it's actually hard to find the P.F. Chang stuff anymore. They took it all offline because, you know, they kind of solved it in one shot, and people didn't have to keep coming back around. Um, LastPass had an interesting vulnerability about three weeks ago that they did a really good job of communicating what was going on. Um, I, there's a small link at the bottom um, that starts with the word, my mom wouldn't want me staying on stage. Um, F yeah, postmortems. Um, actually does a really good job of linking to good postmortems that you could use for, for examples. So, uh, you, by the way, we've been through about 110 slides. It's going pretty well. Um, so in closing, this amazing quote from Warren Buffett, it takes 20 years to build a reputation, five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, you'll do things differently. Um, you only get one shot to talk about these breaches the first time, and if you don't do it well, um, you're going to be dealing with the repercussions for a very long time. So to do this better, what, what you can take home and start you know, start doing as, as soon as you get back to do crisis communications better. Um, make your crisis communications plan. Um, know who you're going to have to message to. 
know who's going to decide how you message, uh, know what methods you're going to use to message. So know whether you're going to publish a press statement or whether you're going to go on Twitter first. And know your voice. Know how you want to talk about that stuff. There's a lot of public relations stuff talking about voice. And it's, it's really key when it comes to uh, dealing with an incident. Uh, I might have said these once or twice before, but be clear, be timely, actionable, responsible, and human. Um, I, I did steal a bunch of stuff from people who know more about this than I do. Um, Kate works at GitHub, so she probably can't help you very much. Uh, Rachel and Kristen both are, are public folks who do this for, for consulting if you're interested. Um, Mark Imbriaco was one of GitHub's original ops people. And he kind of wrote the book from, from GitHub's perspective on how we do this type of messaging well. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm S. Roberts. There's a link to my original blog post. Appreciate you coming out. It's early, no coffee. This bit. I wonder if I leave this up longer if it makes you clap longer. <laughs> All right, no, 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 that wasn't that. Wasn't that. No. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Sure. No problem. I promise it doesn't go to somewhere hosting Safari, Firefox, but not Chrome O Day. Um, uh, okay. A any questions? We do. Um, I mean, we have an on-call rotation, and whoever's on call when something happens is, is incident commander, and that's, that's how we deal with it. Um, you know, there may be circumstances where it gets big enough we want to start shuffling that around, but at least the initial is generally going to be handled by the person who's on call at the time. So for, for some reason, um, most of our public relations team came out of um, the, the crisis communications as kind of their default thing. Um, so it turns out that was the thing we were already really good at and, and had a lot of very sharp people. Um, we learned a lot of lessons for the security side of it from the ops side of it, because it turns out a lot of the lessons that go into how to deal with a breach or a you know, DDoS or something like that are the same you have to talk about if a transit provider goes out for something totally non-malicious. So we thankfully had some not as bad practice in that regard. So. That's, that's, that's really tough. Um, and, and from my perspective, that's where, um, that's why the security team doesn't handle this on its own. That's why we bring in our PR team to, to help us manage that. Because in a, in a lot of cases, I mean, the answer is it depends. You know, if there's, a, if there's another organization that you can reach directly out to and have a dialogue, you can coordinate that. Um, in some cases, you don't have that option, and you just have to kind of to, uh, to go with it. Um, but, but that's part of why putting out the best message you can ahead of time and being the ones who control the start of it makes a big difference. You know, the thing that Slack did was because they put out so much information in the first moment you knew about it, there wasn't a lot of other story. There wasn't a lot, you know, B Brian Krebs didn't write an article that I know of, I looked, about Slack, because frankly, they'd told the whole story, and all he was going to do was reiterate everything that they'd already said. And if you can get to that position, you kind of get to win.
Yes, absolutely. So um, based on our internal uh, messaging on this, I can't go into details, but we, we had the DDoS that we dealt with a few um, weeks ago. It's, feels like it's been forever. Um, and based on the nature of the DDoS, public researchers were doing a lot of digging into the JavaScript injects and things like that. Um, you know, our timelines changed because of that. Um, that didn't necessarily mean it was a bad thing. In some cases, they were able to say things that we didn't, but it definitely has to be taken into account. Yes. That's, that's actually a, a, great, a great point. I mean, having a off your major um, perimeter place to post information is, is really key. So um, I know we use a third party service um, as a, for our status site. And that's essentially where we'd post things if for some reason we couldn't post directly to github.com. Uh, there's a few that do already. So. Anybody else? Cool. Well, I'm around. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, I had a question slide. Thank you so much, thank you. Scott. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, thank you. And you probably have one of those already, huh? I don't. What? No. Well, I'm honored to give you your first one. Well, thank you. All right. So we got a break here. We got a break until 10:15. Come back in. You know, choose track one. Track one. I have something for you.